Hello, this is Dr. Paula Rosen, publisher of Education Update. I'm privileged to be here in New York City with President Louise Mirror and uh, Dr. Sharon Dunn of the New York Historical Society, the oldest museum in New York City. I found out something new. 1804, we are surrounded in this fabulous boardroom by iconic historical figures, including the one right behind President Mirror, who is DeWitt Clinton. The help, the, he was a mayor and he was a, a, a governor of New York State. So it's just privileged to be here with both of you, as well as all these iconic dead figures. But <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, the uh, old adage, um, if you don't study history, you're doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. What is your opinion about that? It's absolutely true. Louise, by the way. Of course. <laughs> That adage is absolutely true. There are so many, many examples of times at which people forget the past and they forget that the past can teach. Um, and if they they don't haven't even learned in the first instance what has happened, what has been the experience of previous generations, what have been the good things that they've done and why, and what have been the mistakes that they've made and why, then uh, we do have a, a repetition. Of, um, of things that should not happen at all. This view is, I have been here a number of times, but I haven't been here since the renovation. And I just was absolutely floored by how spectacular the building looks and the lobby looks. And just some of the exhibits that you've had in the past are, are the uh, Slavery in New York and Lincoln in New York. And uh, the I think one of the purposes of the museum is to highlight and underscore the importance of learning and understanding history. So am I on the right path when I say this? Yes, you are. We always say that education is the cornerstone of all that we do. And uh, in particular with history education, there is uh, such a diminishing focus on learning history, certainly learning American history, and certainly learning pre-20th century American history in the schools and in colleges and even in PhD programs these days, that uh, we uh, we fill that rhetoric with real meaning at the New York Historical Society. Well, they're lucky to have you at the helm, Louise, and you and I know that you hold a double PhD in Spanish and the humanities from Stanford University. So New York is lucky to have gotten you from California. One of the other things that really amazes me about this place is the breadth and the width of of all of the. Uh, exhibits here. You have the largest collection of Hudson River school paintings. Nobody even knows that. They think, oh, if somebody had a guess, they'd say, of course, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but it's not. It's the New York Historical Society that has them. How did you come upon this collection? We're a collection of collections. And um, in many, many cases, the Hudson River School of Paintings is one salient example. We were given an entire collection by a collector or by the descendants of the collector. And uh, in the case of the Hudson River School paintings, Lumen Reed was a great collector of 19th century. In fact, he's responsible for giving us a taste for American art because in his day, it was really only European paintings that counted in European artists. But uh, he decided, why not collect American? And uh, he began to do that. And after he died, um, he gave us, he had created a gallery in his townhouse in uh, Greenwich Village to show off his collection. And after his death, we were given the entire collection, along with some of the accoutrements that had uh, graced the gallery in his Greenwich Village townhouse. Fabulous. And I've seen some of them. They're fabulous. Let's talk about the new exhibit here, World War II and New York City. And I think many people, again, don't realize 900,000 New Yorkers were involved in the war effort in World War II. And we only hope that 900,000 New Yorkers show up to see this exhibit and, and more because it's spectacular. Can you tell us a little bit about the World War II exhibit? Well, New York was really central to the war. And uh, when people think of World War II, they don't really think of the home front. They think of the battlefields. But um, New York did everything. It was absolutely instrumental to the production and manufacturing of everything from aircraft, uh, and that's New York writ large, to shipbuilding, to deploying 
uh, men and women overseas to doing all the training. So you have huge swaths of the city that were taken over by the, the machinery of war. And uh, Hunter, Hunter College's campus in the Bronx, for example, became a training center for women who were in the military. Um, it was the waves, wasn't it? It yeah. was the waves. Yes. And uh, there's a marvelous photograph of the waves, masses of waves training in, um, on the Hunter College campus in the Bronx, now Lehman College today. Um, and uh, the Manhattan Project, I mean, people think, well, the Manhattan Project, that has nothing to do with Manhattan. Who knows how it got that name? Well, actually, the Manhattan Project was centered at Columbia University in Manhattan. And we have a map in the show that shows all of the points around the city um, at which this, uh, this project really took shape. And um, we even have a piece of the cyclotron, which um, was at Columbia University and used to... I mean, it's here. Yeah. Is it on loan or is it permanently here? It's on loan from the Smithsonian. <laughs> it was quite an adventure to get it inside the building. It's a gargantuan piece of machinery. So how did you get it in? Oh, we had a, a team and uh, um, doors being removed. And, you know, it was a big, <laughs> it was a big project. Did it fit in the elevator? Um, it's on the, actually on the first floor, okay. thankfully. So uh, as long as it got in the door, it could, could <laughs> get into the gallery. Oh, but that was a big adventure. Right. So, and it also added to the economy of New York City, didn't it? Absolutely, it yes, it. Mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, war is, um, is a really terrible thing. Um, uh, so, you, you know, you don't necessarily like to see the positive, but it really was an engine for economic development in the city. People had jobs as a result of the war, and many of them were women who hadn't worked previously or didn't have the opportunity to work, but with the men away. Um, women, the world of women's work really expanded, and, uh, and the war was a, was a savior for many people who had suffered during the Depression. Now, I know the exhibit will be here through the very end of May 2013, so viewers should not despair if they can't make it this month. They have plenty of months to make it. Um, I think some of the images that would be of great interest to the public, one of Penn Station with hordes of military people there. I mean, there were hordes of people going through, and crowds going through Penn Station every single day. I use Penn Station from time to time. But the, the, the image of all the military there is something unusual. And the other unusual uh, photograph, for those people who are interested in underwear, uh, it is the maiden form company with the brassieres that they're advertising for women who are going to be in the military and need, you know, some additional uh, something for their uniforms. Yeah, we've got a bra in the exhibit, too. <laughs> <laughs> so there were all kinds of interesting things to see. I was particularly taken with the Macy's poster that canceled the Thanksgiving Day Parade uh, because the resources were being saved for the troops. And I couldn't help but reflect on our current situation in New York City, the canceling of the marathon by the mayor so that they could save the resources and the, and the uh, uh, generators for those who were destitute and in need. So, I, I mean, there was this definitely a, a you know, we, here we talk about World War II and we talk about 2012 in New York City. Yeah. Well, I think, as you said before, you know, the lessons of history. So yes. if you look back and, and see how a decision was taken and why, might guide you in, in, uh, in taking a, a decision right, in the right. present moment. And I understand that there was some money raised here at the New York Historical Society for the hurricane victims. Yes. We, um, we opened on Wednesday after the hurricane. We were really the only cultural institution in the city to open its doors on time at 10 a.m., but uh, we thought it was, you know, in light of the destruction, unconscionable to... Um, to fill our own coffers, so uh, so we raised right. money for the hurricane. Um, you know, I noticed that you had some riveting Friday night lectures and movies to accompany the World War II exhibit. I th this is a fabulous, uh, you know, a, a, a extra that you've added on. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those lectures and movies that you're showing? And I know there were two in particular that caught my eye. One of our aircraft is missing, a movie that was made in 1942, and the other one is something that many of us know from here to eternity uh, that was made in 1953. But you've got film directors and producers and, and historians uh, accompanying the movies. How did you choose the movies? 
Well, uh, there are a lot of great World War II movies. So um, we actually reached out to a, a swath of people who we knew loved movies, know a lot about them, and know a lot about American history as well, and asked them what their favorite movie was. So um, <laughs> in many instances, that's, how, that's what led us to the film. In some instances, um, we wanted to privilege a story, the Tuskegee Airmen, for example, and George Lucas had made a film called Red Tails that everybody um, really had paid a lot of attention to. And we had the opportunity to have him, uh, along with a former CUNY colleague of mine, Roscoe Brown, who was a Tuskegee Airman. And right. that, was a, that was really a, a unique and splendid evening. Do you have any of those lectures taped so if people miss them, they can... Yes, we do. We, um, we, we do do podcasts of our lectures, and they are available through our website. Terrific. Sharon, would you like to uh, share some thoughts with us as Dr. Dunn, Sharon Dunn, uh, about the Domena Children's Center or about the education programs here at the New York Historical Society? Well, there's a lot to say about both. Uh, the Domena Children's History Museum is a remarkable resource, and it... Um, it, it not only shares things in our collection that, that children would never get to see otherwise, but it helps them think about what it, it might have been like to be a child 100 years ago. And, and one of the goals that we had from the education perspective when we were working on this, because it had been it, the designers designed it and the collection kind of dictated what we could show, but what was the message that we wanted children to come away with was a sense of empathy, a, a thought about if I had lived 100 years ago, I might have had to go to work, and I might not have been allowed to go to school. I might have wound up um, with parents who couldn't take care of me, as so often happened in the early 20th century and late 19th century. Uh, children who wound up on the orphan train, uh, abandoned by their families for whatever reason, health, um, substance abuse, almost anything you can imagine, and then winding up uh, with an entirely new family, sometimes not more than an indentured servant, sometimes becoming, you know, a wonderfully happy, part of a wonderfully happy family. And so um, those kinds of experiences that help children think about things, very important to us. Are there hands-on experiences as well? Completely hands-on. There's touch objects and there are many things to see. Anything that's hard to see, there are movable magnifying glasses. Um, there are scenes of New York then and now. There are stories about uh, important people and people in New York who were not so much important individually, but were, were kind of collectively important to tell the story of New York history and how New York was really, um, this, the, to us, the, the spearhead of the entire nation. Yeah. And so uh, we talk about that. Right. And, and you have many school groups coming? In? We have, last year we served, um, well, we served 800 schools last year in one form or another, some coming into the building for not just the Domena program, but our education programs, usually in entire museum. We have thematic programs based on different areas in history. We're very conscious of the scope and sequence that students have to follow and teachers follow for every grade. And so our programs address every era in New York City and American history, and our collections illuminate it. Um, we have wonderful trained educators who do outreach in the schools, and we have wonderful educators who lead programs here. So the educators from the New York Historical Society go into the schools as well mm -hmm. as... Yes, and we developed this very interesting residency called the Art of History. And in that residency, which is a five-week program in basically almost any grade in elementary school, but mostly um, around fourth and fifth grade and seventh and eighth grade are the target audience, although we do something similar with eleventh grade, who those students study United States history, um, we uh, use works of art mm -hmm. and, and visual art making for children. So they study American history, art history, and then they create something in the visual arts which illuminates what they've learned. So, Sharon, I'm ready to come back as a little kid. It's I'm wonderful. My first stop is the New York Historical Society. Well, you'll make some fun works of art as part of it. You have some other talks here that are not related to World War II, which, was, which were very interesting, I thought. U.S. Colored Troops in Action, Lincoln and Emancipation, Invisible Armies. How are these topics chosen? Well, uh, over this five-year span, um, we are commemorating the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, and uh, this is a natural institution to participate in those commemorations. So um, with the help of Harold Holzer, who actually now is a Roger Hertog Fellow, 
at the New York Historical Society, we've organized a series that really share with people some of the lessons, again, going back to your mm -hmm. comment initially, some of the lessons of, uh, of a terrible, terrible war that divided the country in ways you know, that we've seen very recently resonate today. And also, you have history and walking tours of New York City. I, I, you know, I could come here every single day for the next month and find something fabulous to do. How did that come about? Well, you know, we have a great facility, and we focus a lot of attention, obviously, on remaking this facility into a real destination, a place that everyone can thrill to, to the, the history of the nation and the city. But there's so much to see that's outside our building. So, um, so we've organized walking tours that... Uh, again, make use of some of the greatest historians and uh, their ability to tell stories outside of the building. Can you comment on the Graduate Institute on Constitutional History? You actually have a partnership with several different colleges, and some are in Washington, D.C. Can you tell us something about, and would a student who's in that get a degree Well, what happens is the, the Graduate Institute is a... Um, it's a place uh, to learn about constitutional history. Almost no graduate department, PhD granting department um, in the country still offers coursework on that topic. So a, a late stage graduate student or um, even a faculty member who's interested in teaching constitutional history can come and take seminars here or in Washington. Um, and degrees are granted and credit is granted through partner institutions. And uh, that works very well. Us. Well, that sounds terrific. Now, the latest initiative uh, that I want to speak about is the one in Washington, D.C., in the White House, with none other than First Lady Michelle Obama. Well, thanks to the work of my great colleague, uh, Sharon Dunn, and her team of educators, we have invented a fabulous uh, internship program for high school students. And um, the students are with us either during the year or during the summer, or in some cases both. And uh, they really learn how to be historians, but historians writ large. Um, our institution has a full complement of people who work around history, sometimes in very surprising ways. Conservation, for example. Um, you know, uh, apprentice yourself to our chief conservationist, and you'll learn a lot about chemistry. Who would, who would think of putting a rare document in a water bath? But, that's how you restore it. Oh, so, Louise, in, in terms of uh, the uh, students who come from high school, are they from public, private, or any, any high school? Well, we're happy to work with any students, but our, our, the main event for us is the New York City public schools, and the vast majority of our now a uh, couple of hundred thousand students that we reach um, are in the New York City public schools, and we also reach their teachers as well. And... That's really how we define our mission. We, we love having, we have private and parochial school students, and we love having them. So, um, and they are totally welcome. And we have homeschool programs, yeah. again, thanks to Sharon's initiative. Um, but uh, we really do see our mission as, um, as reaching students who might not enjoy the benefit of um, an enrichment program in history. History is fabulous. It's interesting. It's like detective work. And, it's exciting, but it is so deadened often when it's taught in the schools. I have no idea why, but, um, but that does often happen. So we really see ourselves as, uh, as the main place to come to see how, how exciting and important history is. And of course, in the New York City public schools, there's such a um, large number of students who are either new Americans themselves or whose parents are new Americans. So, you know, if you don't, if you, if you want to participate in the the civic uh, projects of this nation, you really need to know something about it. It's, it's important, but it's an expectation. And, um, and we help students to achieve that expectation. So, uh, so we see ourselves as a main adjunct to the public schools in New York. Can you tell us something about the, uh, I know it's a, a male student, 17-year-old male yeah. student. I got a little bit of advance notice <laughs> that's going to the White House with you. Can you tell us a little something about him? Well, you know, I've, I've actually had the chance to get to know him both um, in his internship here, and he is now one of our teen leaders. So 
he now has a leadership role in helping us to figure out ways of, of best engaging other high school students. But he, um, he's also a student at the Frederick Douglass Academy. So um, we have wonderful partnerships with Gilder Lerman Institute, and they in turn have a wonderful partnership with the Fre Frederick Douglass Academy to um, enrich the opportunities for students to study American history there. And, uh, and he's participated. So he, he's both been enriched by what we've offered and by what uh, Frederick Douglass Academy has offered. And uh, he's a real terrific historian in the making. He's a, he's, a great, he's a great student, and I think he has a brilliant future ahead of him. Well, we'd like to highlight him at some point as well. Um, now, thinking about uh, the, the students that come here, uh, how are they chosen? Well, um, there is a selection process. It's an interesting question because part of, um, part of this program is, um, is funded by the Pinkerton Foundation. Pinkerton Foundation wanted us to look only at the, the neediest students. And when we talked about a selection process, you know, they were a little bit worried, were we going to sort of skim off the top? And, you know, we explained to them that, um, indeed, these are truly needy students, but if you don't have an application process, um, if you don't have an evaluation process to, uh, to see whether students are right for the program and will benefit from it, then, um, you know, then you quite often end up with students who aren't really committed. So above all, we are looking for students, not, you know, the top students in the city, but, um, but students who will really apply themselves and can really benefit from the experience of a marvelous opportunity to learn about the makings of a museum in, in all ways. Right, right. I can't help but notice Roger Hertog's name in the lobby as, you, as we all come in and the thanks that's given to him and to his leadership and his philanthropic uh, spirit uh, that enabled the museum. And I do know, uh, you know, Gilder and Lerman, Dick Gilder and Lou Lerman, who have been instrumental here as well. Any, any comments about those great philanthropists that you are so lucky to have in your corner? Lucky is the right word. We are extremely lucky, and um, I personally am here because of them. Uh, I knew any, any institution that Dick Gilder bet on <laughs> would be a success. He's, um, he's a great investor, but he is someone who is so dedicated to the American story, uh, warts and all, um, but he's dedicated to the American story and the importance of conveying it, particularly to young children. And uh, his directive to me is, I want to see those school buses in front. Oh, that's, um, that's a great way to say it. And Roger Hertog, of course, um, is a, he's a wonderful patriot. And um, his vision for this institution is, is to make everyone enjoy being an American and engage in the, uh, the qualities that have really shaped our success in this country. It's, it's wonderful to work with all three of them. This museum is a treasure. It's a jewel. And I've been to a lot of cities across this country, and I have never seen anything that is like this. And they're lucky to have you, Louise, at the helm, to bring it to this great position that it's in now. And Sharon, you, as the director of the education division, I thank you both for letting me come and visit with you today. And now I'm going to go on to see the rest of the exhibits. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.